I think the work that is being done by AAKP is so critical to patients all around the country. Their ability to advocate on our behalf ensures that everybody understands the impact of kidney disease and what they can do to help us. Now everybody is fully understanding that um, to achieve a better quality of life, you really need to listen and take into consideration what the patient views as a better quality of life for them. I always have fun at an AAKP event. How could you not have fun? You, you're with people who understand completely what you and your family are going through. So it's not just for patients, AAKP. AAKP should be for the family of patients because when a patient has kidney disease, the family has kidney disease. Belonging to an uh, independent advocacy organization like AAKP gives me the confidence that I can represent them and uh, people living with kidney disease um, to represent them honestly. Our objective over the, the, the coming decade is to reach people around the globe and not, not just limit it to uh, the United States because kidney disease is, is a universal disease. They uh, encourage patients to be the voice for their care and treatment. And I don't see that as much in other organizations. And I feel like that is so necessary for patients to feel like they have a voice and they can make change in regards to their care and treatment. I think the AKP, by being a patient-oriented group, um, impacts um, not only the uh, medical devices, but pharmaceuticals and pretty much anything that's to, to do with the patients because those, those companies will respond more to a patient than they will to a doctor, I think. It's important to be a patient advocate because uh, to whom much is given, much is required. I was given this gift of life back in 2008 by my donor, Leanne, rest in peace. She was a deceased donor. So, now, if I can use my voice and use my platform and influence to impact lives, and my favorite word, why not? And why not become an organ and tissue donor today? We spend a lot of time here, particularly in D.C., in the nation's capital, talking with staff, with the legislators, and trying to help them understand exactly what the patient perspective is on anything that's kidney or renal related. It's a great honor to be able to do it. Our numbers are growing, and part of our strategy is for them to understand that we will come and visit and talk with them, and we represent the patient voice, and we want that to be heard, and that's how we do it. People around the world who are sick and suffering with kidney disease need a voice of optimism, they need the tactics, and they need the reinforcement from fellow patients here in the U.S to do what they do and demand a change in the status quo. And we fully intend to arm patients around the world with the tools they need to be more vocal with their governments, regardless of the ideology of their government, and to demand solutions and to defend private sector companies and investors who are willing to get into this space and deliver more innovation for patients. AAKP opens the door so that it broadens the whole horizon. You're one person. When you belong to AAKP, you suddenly become a tribe. Welcome to today's Healthline webinar, the latest in our COVID-19 series, Taking Care of Your Dialysis Access During the COVID-19 Pandemic, hosted by AAKP's Center for Patient Education and Research. I would like to give a special thank you to our webinar sponsor, Avenue Medical, and we'll hear from them a little bit later in the presentation. AAKP is the nation's largest independent kidney patient organization, and we are vigorous advocates for the right of patient consumers to choose the therapies that align best to their personal aspirations and life goals, including kidney transplants and home dialysis. AAKP's Healthline webinar program falls under our Center for Patient Research and Education, 
We believe patient and caregiver education is an integral part of treatment and protection of patient lives. And we work to ensure that patients remain at the center of all kidney research and policy that impacts their lives. This includes federal policies and private sector innovations that impact healthcare services, assistance programs, and access to new products and services. This is especially true during national emergencies such as the coronavirus <laughs> pandemic, because kidney patients are considered among the most vulnerable populations. At this time, I'd like to introduce AAKP's president, Richard Knight. Richard is a former in-center hemodialysis patient who received his kidney transplant 14 years ago. Richard? Thank you, Erin. First, I would like to thank everyone who has shown a concern for kidney patients and the threat of the COVID-19 and who joined us on the call today. Our accesses, be it a fistula, a graft, or catheter, they serve as our lifeline to good dialysis treatments. All of us with accesses deal with the challenges they present. Shortly, you'll see where I'm pictured with a Dr. Berlin back in 2018 when we discussed fistulas on his doctor radio show. We've had a long history and concern about accesses for our patients. Today's webinar will bring you information for caring for your dialysis accesses during this pandemic. We've arranged and hosted today's webinar because AAKP for 50 years has served as an independent voice of patients. And we take our role in educating patients and providing insights into their concerns to policy leaders. We take that role very seriously. COVID-19 is a serious threat to all Americans, especially with those with underlying health conditions and who are immunosuppressed like kidney patients. I pray for everyone who is or who may face the threat of this disease. Many of you have registered for this program, have sent in great questions for Dr. Kramer and Dr. Bethard, which they will answer at the end of their presentation. But I'm asking all of you who are listening and watching to stay connected to AAKP and share your involvement in our online efforts. Because although our reach is growing, we believe that we need to educate more patients about how serious this virus is and the threat they face, and we need your help in doing that. I will now ask my fellow transplant recipient, AAKP Chair of Policy and Global Affairs, and immediate past president, Paul Conway, to say a few words and talk about our survey research. Paul? Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, for the Center for Patient Education and Research, uh, probably the most impactful thing that we've been able to do over the past several months is to reach directly out to kidney patients through a series of survey mechanisms that we have uh, through the Center for Patient Education and Research. And these are called flash surveys and tracking surveys. And we harvest information uh, from patients on what their primary concerns are. We formulate them into questions and then we broadcast it out to a much wider audience to survey them on the depth of that concern. You will see these come from time to time. We encourage you to uh, participate in those because what we specifically do with the information that we glean from that is we provide that to policymakers, uh, both on the executive branch, HHS, and also uh, on Capitol Hill. They're very impactful. It gives people a sense of what's happening in real time. And during the COVID-19 crisis, it has been instrumental in communicating the lack of knowledge that patients have or are receiving from providers and helps arm patients with information from the CDC, from the fine medical team and advocates that you're going to listen to today in their presentations, to help patients ask the questions they need to ask and to let policymakers know and providers know how they could help us as patients do a better job managing our care in the midst of a crisis. One of the questions that you see here at the top center was asked, and um, that was how many uh, patients, kidney patients, believe that they're vulnerable to the coronavirus. This is 78%. That number's been staying that high, and in some cases, in some of our surveys, is at 92%. We can attribute that to the saturation of media coverage and the messaging that's been done uh, by NIH, uh, Dr. Fauci, and also Dr. Burks, uh, getting it communicated out to those who are at risk. Based on the survey information, we also 
uh, calibrate our social media displays. And you'll see on the left a graphic there of patients stay home, uh, the facts that we communicate out based on fact sheets from the CDC as they evolve. And then also on the right-hand side, this is very important, we used patient survey data to communicate directly to HHS Secretary Azar and the HHS Office of Civil Rights the concerns that patients were having reading stories about potential denial of care for kidney patients if they seek treatment at the hospitals. Um, the Office of Civil Rights issued guidance, very clear guidance, several weeks ago on a Saturday afternoon to make it very clear uh, to hospitals and hospital systems that patients are covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act, kidney patients, especially dialysis patients. This is very important. AAKP will pr be providing additional updates from HHS. They'll be on our social media pages so everybody knows what they have a right to as a citizen who happens to have kidney disease. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you for everybody who's joined the call today. Thank you so much, Paul. I'd like to now introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Ari Kramer. Dr. Kramer is an assistant professor of surgery at Spartanburg Medical Center, where he has served as the principal vascular access surgeon for the establishment, maintenance, and surveillance of hemodialysis access, access since 2005. His service provides an array of traditional and minimally invasive dialysis access options to patients with renal failure in much of upstate South Carolina and lower North Carolina. His professional accomplishments include teaching awards, national podium presentations, educational seminars, peer-reviewed journal publications, ongoing participation in quality improvement projects, and emerging technology trials focused on improving care for patients with renal impairment. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer, for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thanks so much. Um, that's quite an introduction, and um, I'd like to really begin by thanking AAKP for including me in this presentation. It's, it's really an honor to be sharing time with all of you and the distinguished panelists who will be following and who have led off, who have provided innumerable hours and incredible service, creating better resources, healthcare opportunities, and quality of life for the community of renal patients. Um, I think, as you've, you've all touched on already, it's, it's a particularly poignant time to be discussing access care. Uh, clear messages and communication about how to protect ourselves, our families, our communities have been changing almost daily. Um, there's great fear. Uh, it's palpable, and there's great concern, and it's shared by us all. It's, uh, it's demonstrated by the survey you just heard. Um, and in view of this pandemic, I think that we need to focus our efforts and refocus our efforts, honestly, on the actions that we as individuals need to do to control our personal destiny and return just a measure of calm and confidence in our day-to-day -day living. Uh, so with that said, let's get into it. Um, my hope is I can give you some insight and some hopefulness that you can remain safe, and utilize resources available to you to recognize problems and avoid potential problems that can lead to emergencies. I want to just touch on some brief concepts that you'll hear again and again reiterated throughout the rest of this program and in much greater detail that I think you'll find consistent with things in fact you already know. I think you'll find some comfort in knowing that you may already be very aware of these things and while the world has changed significantly over the past few weeks the things that you know about your personal safety are consistent with what you knew before the pandemic began. And at the very basic level, recommendations for hand washing, limiting contact of your hands to your face, self-isolating, and avoiding of co-mingling, particularly with people who are known to be sick, should be avoided. And these concepts should be adhered to whenever possible. It won't come as a surprise to anybody that hospitals are being overwhelmed by patients who are ill with coronavirus, that the resources are scarce, and that systems that were typically available to you and I for care are now strained and may not be available and likely not available in the same way they were before the pandemic hit us. 
So it's imperative that we do everything we can to stay well. It's imperative that we make sure that our access is functioning well. It's imperative that you know if you need help with your access, that you're not alone and you have resources, starting with your dialysis unit to help you find the assistance you need. Again, I'd like to remind you that the most basic level of care is a functioning access to receive dialysis. I'll also remind you that little problems quickly can become big problems if we don't pay attention to the detail. And I'd like to highlight that again because healthcare resources are again, as mentioned, so scarce. Not only are the intensive care units, by the way, being consumed for ventilator support, but dialysis machines are being scavenged and used to support patients who have fallen ill with kidney disease because of the coronavirus. Items that traditionally we've taken for granted are just not available. Personal protection devices, masks, gowns, eyewear, in many places have vanished completely. Blood products have been severely restricted because the number of donations available have dwindled dramatically in an era of lockdown and isolation. In most areas of the country, subsequently, elective surgery has rightfully been abandoned to preserve the remaining supply of these items for emergency care. But that doesn't mean the pandemic is going to go on forever. And that doesn't mean that you need to stop thinking about your personal care and how to stay safe at home and at your clinic. For those who dialyzing with a catheter, you should continue to plan on getting a permanent dialysis access. You should communicate wherever possible with your nephrologist or surgeon to understand your future permanent dialysis access options. And when possible, you should utilize technology like telehealth visits to discuss your option with your healthcare professional. This time should be used to reflect on your particular circumstance. You can advance slides uh, kind of along the way, by the way, I'm sorry. Um, and, and keep your appointment. Keep active with your education. If you're new to the world of dialysis access, let me review briefly the main types. So we're gonna move forward on the slides to discuss the access types. There are essentially blood dialysis and peritoneal dialysis. And blood dialysis is given one of three ways, via a central catheter, a graft, or a fistula. Peritoneal dialysis is delivered through a catheter in your belly. And those are essentially compromising the complete picture of your permanent dialysis options until perhaps a transplant becomes available. Breaking it down with a little bit more detail, I'd like to very quickly discuss about each of those access options. So we'll move on to the central catheter placement slide. A central venous catheter is just a tube that's been inserted into the vein of your neck, chest, or leg, and that extends directly into the heart via extension limbs that are hanging outside of the body. Catheters generally are temporary for most patients on dialysis and should be kept temporary whenever possible. They must always be kept covered, clean, dry, and sterile. These devices should be considered a bridge. They should be considered a rescue device until you can get a permanent dialysis access. Now on the positive side of things, catheters can be life-saving. It can be used immediately after they're placed. On the downside, however, their proper care makes them very restrictive to the activities of daily living. And I know that many of you on the call today know this. Things like showering, swimming, are real no-nos because of the incredibly high risk of infection. Catheters are also known to cause internal damage to the large veins that feed the heart that can then 
be permanent and limit your future options for further dialysis access therapies, which are life saving. It's super important if you're in this position, dialyzing with a catheter, that you pay attention to your options to move forward, that you grow somewhat impatient with a plan to develop the next plan. Remember to stay in contact with your healthcare team. Make plans to get your catheter out in favor of a permanent dialysis access option. On the next slide, we're going to talk briefly about fistula surgery. This, this is fistulas, and fistulas are a direct connection, in plain English, between an artery and a vein. And think of them as creating a high-flow super vein. The fistula is created typically in a surgical operating room, and it's largely considered the gold standard for permanent access. It's generally regarded as providing the best overall performance for patients on dialysis. It allows them the least chance of infection. It can last for many, many, many years with proper care, but they're not always available for every patient in every circumstance. They also can take quite a while to develop before they can be used, which can create some difficulties. And as I mentioned before, hospital resources have in fact grown quite scarce, particularly operating rooms. But we're fortunate in today's world uh, that we're able to, we're gonna, um, you know, to discuss a very promising technology known as a percutaneous fistula. Uh, this technology is, is an incredible potential opportunity for patients where it is available, which allows a fistula to be created in a non-operating room environment, and in many cases, without a scar. The results, are, again, were incredibly promising, and you should find out if the procedure may be available in your area. It's something in this lockdown era, with the uncertainty about how long operating rooms will be unavailable is an unknown, this may be a potential to create a permanent access in a non-traditional environment. So again, follow up with your healthcare professional to move on from a catheter-based therapy if it's available to you. In some cases, we'll advance to the next slide, you may be offered something called a graft. And a graft functions very similarly to a fistula. It too is a permanent dialysis access option. And a graft, like a fistula, is also a direct connection between an artery and a vein, but instead there is a connection or a connecting tube that is synthetic that makes the leap between the artery and vein, like a bridge. And that tube then carries the blood to the dialysis machine, and it, in fact, functions as your access. Now, typically, again, a graft is performed in the operating room, and it is fairly usual for a graft to be able to be used in roughly two to four weeks after it's inserted, but under very special circumstances, there are specific graft types that might be able to be used immediately. Again, not everybody is a candidate for a graft. And grafts do carry a higher risk of infection, and they do have an increased clotting risk when you compare them to fistulas, but they are far, far, far superior to a venous catheter. I'm going to advance again. And now lastly, we're talking here about a peritoneal dialysis. A peritoneal dialysis catheter, or a PD catheter, is a tube that again is typically inserted surgically in an operating room and is placed <laughs> into the abdomen. And this allows a very specialized fluid called dialysate to soak up waste products of your metabolism and then be emptied out of the body. And that's how this form of dialysis works. Dialysis in this occasion typically happens at home. Once the catheter is placed, it can be used in some cases immediately again, but more often in the general setting, it's about two to four weeks after placement. And the very good upside 
is that this does not typically, or does never, in fact, require needles to obtain this dialysis. It also, in this era of pandemic, allows someone to stay home and isolate to protect themselves. On the downside, some patients with previous abdominal surgery might not be strong candidates for successful peritoneal dialysis. Sometimes patients can develop hernias or complications from the fluid that's put in the belly, such as patients who are diabetic, who might end up with incidental weight gain, and sometimes can have increasing challenges and difficulty with controlling their diabetes, and some other serious complications of abdominal infection can occur or advance. In short, our job as surgeons is to give you the best access for you, not for me, not for your nephrologist, but for you. So I encourage you all, ask questions, follow the instructions and recommendations of your doctors and healthcare providers, your dialysis unit, help them help you do the best job they can for you. I encourage everyone on the call, to educate yourself on the options I've described. Tune in carefully to the messaging that follows after I'm done speaking. And remember to attend all of your dialysis appointments. I have just three more slides that I'm gonna read the top level on each of these things because what you'll see is, is gonna be a follow-up for the remainder of the talk. And so just briefly, you'll know these things. If you, if you have a fistula, feel, look, and listen. Check the skin of your access. Check for bulges that are unusual. Constantly check the pulse of your access. Assess the thrill of your access. If you have a graft, again, feel, look, listen. Put your hand on the skin. Check the integrity of the skin. Look for bulges, pulses, and the thrill again. And lastly, if you have a catheter, be particularly sure there are no cracks in the catheter tubing, that the catheter is intact, that the cuff is not coming out. Look for redness and draining and bleeding. And always, always ask questions. Be sure that your staff is using proper hygiene as they access your catheter. So lastly, I would just like to say that if you pay attention small details that we're talking about and we'll continue to talk about throughout this remainder of the conference and remain proactive. You can prevent small complications with your access to turn into large emergencies that can cause you to expose yourself to risk through a hospital admission in today's environment. I'd like to turn to the last slide. I wish you all good health, safety, and in a good life. And in keeping with the spirit of that message, I wanted to share a message from a wise old doctor that he wrote to me, and it is the secret of life, he tells me. And I'll leave you with that to see if you can figure it out. But I thank you all. I wish you all health and cheers. Thank you so much, Dr. Kramer. We greatly appreciate you joining us today and taking time out of your busy schedule to, to share this important information. So thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Gerald Bethard. Dr. Bethard is board certified in internal medicine, nephrology, pathology, allergy and clinical immunology, and interventional nephrology. He has been involved with endovascular procedures performed for dialysis vascular access maintenance procedures since 1985 and is currently a full-time member of the staff of the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston, where he is involved with the Interventional Nephrology Program. Dr. Bethard, thank you for joining us today. I'll turn things over to you. Okay, there, there are several things that, that I'd like to mention before we start. Number one is, is what we're going to talk about here uh, is applicable to your regular life in addition to emphasizing points that are important with this pandemic that's going on. Uh, 
as you know, uh, problems develop with your vascular access. Uh, and most of these problems can be corrected. Uh, many of them tend to be recurrent. The earlier that the problem is recognized, the easier it is to correct and the more likely it is to be corrected successfully. Now, who is in the best position to recognize these problems early? You are, because you know more about your access than any of your caregivers because you live with it, it is part of you, you see it every day. But you can do this only if you become intimately familiar and acquainted with how your access looks, feels, and, and sounds. So let's talk about each of these issues, looking. So it's important to look at your access every day. And things that you're likely to see that are important, uh, you, there are other things that you can obviously see, but things that, that will be <coughs> very important, especially under per present circumstances, are evidence of infection and to look at the character and changes that might be occurring in aneurysms and pseudoaneurysms. So let's look at each of these. So infection, we classify as superficial or deep. Now this is superficial infection. Some of you may have experienced this in the past. This occurs at a cannulation site. It's just a little pustule at the cannulation site. It's superficial. It can be managed at the dialysis center. It can be treated just with topical measures. It's not an emergency. It's not anything, it needs to be addressed, but it's not something that needs to be worried about uh, in an uh, extreme fashion. It's not an emergency. On the other hand, a deep infection is quite different. This is an infection that is beneath the skin. It's around the access, more commonly seen in association with grafts. And it's characterized by swelling, redness, pustules, pain, and not necessarily all of those, but all of those to some degree. And this represents an emergency. You need to, if you recognize this as being present, you need to call your nephrologist immediately. Now, in going through this, I'm going to emphasize that some of these problems are emergency. And the reason that I'm emphasizing that is under the current circumstances in which we are living, the hospitals are trying to limit the care that they give to emergency problems. Now, there are all types of emergencies. And dialysis access problems can definitely be an emergency. They can be life-threatening. Because they're life-threatening, they are, by definition, emergency. This is one of them. This is an emergency. It needs immediate care. Now, aneurysms or pseudoaneurysms. Most of you will see some of these to varying degrees. <laughs> do they need to be treated? Do they, need to, do, do they need to be addressed? Yes, in some instances, but not always. Whether they need to be addressed or not depends on the characteristic of the skin. So we see three categories here. At the very top is just an aneurysm. It's a bulging area. The skin is intact. Uh, it, there's no... Uh, loss of pigmentation, or this sort of thing, it, it, it just needs to be watched. These are frequently caused by uh, poor cannulation techniques, and so rotating needle sites will often uh, be important for this. In the middle section, we see a somewhat larger uh, pseudoaneurysm, and we see, uh, because this is a patient of color, we see some deep pigmentation. Again, the skin is intact. And this does not represent an emergency. Uh, it, it may not even need to be treated. Again, rotating needle sites can be important for this. In the bottom panel, we see the same types of things, except here now we're seeing ulceration over the access. You may see some spontaneous bleeding, just bleeding from that ulcer. This represents an emergency. This, these things can rupture and they can cause very serious problems and even death within a matter of, literally in a matter of minutes. So this represents Dr. Dr. Bethard. Yes. Dr. Bethard, yes. I was gonna ask you, um, when I talk to my patients who have, you know, these findings, particularly in this, you know, I generally, you know, patients get a little concerned because they're looking at, you know, the skin, the pigmentation, et cetera. 
I often tell people if you can pinch the skin over their yes. arm, I mean, over their fistula, that you're probably going to be in good shape. But if it feels more like a knuckle and you can't pinch the skin, that's kind of where you're getting a little bit more concerned. Do you find that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that's a very good point. Now, the, the, one of the questions, you know, if you, can, if you cannot pinch the skin, that may not necessarily be an emergency. But it certainly is an indication that that needs to be addressed, especially if this is a graft, because you have to realize that if this is a graft, at that point, there is a defect in the graft. There is no graft there. The only thing there is the skin. If that skin is tissue paper thin, that's all that, ex that exists between your blood in the access and the blood escaping from the access. If it's ulcerated, then that skin, not only is that the only thing for preventing bleeding, now the skin is defective and it can rupture very quickly. So that's a good point. Yes, See if you can pinch the skin. Okay, now let's move to feel. Now, when I say the word feel, I want you to think in terms of two issues. First is what you feel, the sensation you feel coming from your arm or especially your hand and here is your hand cold is it numb you're having pain in your hand this sort of thing the second issue is feeling of your access yourself with your other hand reaching over and feeling of it so let's consider the first one first okay so coldness numbness pain of the hand these are symptoms of poor blood flow to your hand associated with your access we refer to this as ischemia. That's the medical term that means poor blood flow to an area, ischemia. And it suggests the presence of what we refer to as dialysis access steel syndrome, or sometimes we just refer to that as steel. The access is stealing blood from the hand, and that puts the hand at risk. Now, this can occur immediately or in the first few weeks of ac after access creation, or it can occur at any point afterwards, even years after access has been created. Next slide. So now, just cold hand. If you have cold hand, pale fingertips, as you see in this image here, you, w w the first thing is you need to see, do you have it on both hands? Now, many of you will notice that you, you do have bilateral on both hands both hands are kind of cold and kind of pale at times that does not mean poor blood flow related to your access but if it's just your access hand now that is that's the indicator that this is maybe poor blood flow it's most common shortly after creation and it's not an emergency most of these will resolve on their own the majority of them will go away within a few weeks Next slide. Pain in the hand. So now we have a cold hand that's pale, but now we're also having pain. This is more likely to occur on dialysis. If it's very short period after dialysis access placement, if the access is, is relatively new, again, it generally will go away over a period of few weeks. If access has been a while, it may not go away. So you're having pain in your hand. Is that an emergency or is it not? Well, the question is, is it tolerable? If it's not tolerable, if you just can't tolerate it, what it's gonna do is it's gonna cause you to sharpen your dialysis treatments and it can cause problems with your health. So that needs to be addressed as an emergency if it's intolerable. The only, one way, the only way you can distinguish is whether it's tolerable or not is you. What's tolerable to one patient may not be tolerable to another. So is it intolerable? If it's intolerable, it needs to be addressed. Let's go to the next. We're, we're, what we're doing here is advancing to greater degrees of severity of this poor blood flow to the hand. So here now we have a more serious problem. Now we're developing tissue changes. We see some ulcerations at the ends of the finger. The hand's cold, it's pale, you may have some numbness, you're having pain in your hand, and you're noticing <coughs> little ulcerations at the fingertip. This is an emergency. This needs to be treated immediately. This is as much an emergency as a patient who is in an automobile accident. This needs to be, this can threaten the viability of your hand. It can cause you to lose your hand if it's not addressed because it can be progressive. So, so 
I would yes. I'd like to interject here, you know, from a surgeon's standpoint, that this isn't something that just happened, like you walked outside and there's an oak tree. This is, this is something that uh, has been progressive and has progressed from the first slide to the second slide to this very serious slide and has been either neglected, I think, by a patient's exam, the dialysis clinic, or by the patient themselves in getting uh, sufficient care in a meaningful time. Would you agree with that? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, and, and, it, and it is progressive, and it does take time, and when I say that, that that's an emergency, it doesn't mean that you need to, to, to get up and go, go to the emergency room right now, but it needs to be addressed in, in a relatively short period of day. I, I would say a matter of, of, of days to no more than a week or so. This next category, yes, as you see in the ring finger here, the patient has developed a dead end of his finger the, the, he's had he's going to lose the tip of that finger that is definitely an emergency that needs to be taken care of in a very short period of time and again as dr kramer emphasized this progresses from the early stage as we presented to this late stage but this represents an emergency and and if you go to the hospital and they turn you away because they say we're going to take care of emergency situation then that indicates a lack of knowledge on their part because this is an emergency. So now let's feel of your access. And what I mean here is not sensation that you feel coming from your hand or your access, but you feeling of yourself. And, and Dr. Kramer's already emphasized this, the pulse and the thrill are two things. Now the pulse is it's the thing that corresponds to your heartbeat. Let's go to the next slide. So pulse, as your heart beats, that pulse is propagated down through your access, and you can feel it. And normally, there should be very little pulse there. The, the, your, your access, especially the fissure, now the graft is not so soft because it's an artificial tube, but the same principle holds there. So the fistula should be very soft and easily compressible. Now, when you feel of the pulse, it's best to feel of it with your fingertip and it's very lightly. If you compress your fistula, you'll create a pulse because you're obstructing your fistula. So you feel it very lightly. It should be very soft. If you press on it, it compresses very easily. Now, on the other hand, if what you feel is it's very pulsatile, it's just pounding and it's very firm, you have trouble compressing it. What it says to you is that there is a stenosis or a narrowing somewhere within the access that will need to be ad addressed, but that's not an emergency. Now, in the in normal circumstances, before this pandemic occurred and after this pandemic occurs, when, when that is detected, the, their caregivers are gonna say, we want to get this scheduled for treatment, uh, generally an angioplasty, to, to treat that. But it's not urgent, it's an elective procedure so as long as your dialysis is being effective and it's being efficient dialysis and you're able to do your dialysis well, that can wait a few weeks until things get better at the hospitals. The thrill, we didn't get to mention that on the previous slide, but the thrill is the vibration that you feel over your access. And that's best felt at the arterial anastomosis. So if you, it's best felt with the palm of your hand. So if you put your, your palm of your hand over your access, you'll feel this buzz, this kind of a machinery-like vibration going on. And what that is indicative of is blood flow in your access. And that should, of course, be there. So if you feel of it and there's no thrill there, you can't feel that buzz anywhere, it suggests that your access is clotted. Now, if your access is clotted, that is an emergency. Now, that, that, it's because you can't dialyze. What's gonna happen if you can't dialyze? Things are gonna go downhill very quickly. So that is an emergency, and that needs to be taken care of in an emergent fashion. As so, an aside there, I would... Yes. Yeah, as an aside there, um, you know, it's been my experience that no matter how many lectures we give and talk about, uh, patients who, who check their accesses who will still report that the dialysis centers may occasionally want to stick a, an access that's non-functional. How would you advise the patients in that circumstance 
in this, particularly in this pandemic, to avoid complications of, you know, cannulation, you know, errors, et cetera, so that they don't worsen a bad situation. Yeah, you know, what happens, uh, and that's a good point, when you go to the dialysis unit, as, as you know, uh, the shift is changing. And everybody, of course, wants to get on uh, dialysis so they get off as quickly as possible. And so the staff of the dialysis uh, center is trying to get everybody on as quickly as they can. And they often, they should, but many times they don't examine your access very well before they try to cannulate it. Now, if you go, if you have already examined it yourself and you detect there's no thrill, before they cannulate it, before they try to cannulate it, you say, oh, wait a minute, I don't feel anything here. I used to feel a good thrill or a buzz in my fistula and it is gone. I need for you to check it before you cannulate because I think it is clotted. If it's clotted and they cannulate it, it does increase somewhat your chances of get, getting infected. So let's go to the next slide. So now let's, we've talked about looking and, and feeling. Now let's talk about listening. Now listening may not be quite as important, but many of you have a stethoscope and many of you have been shown, you know, how to listen to your, to your access. And this thrill that we feel, we can also hear and we call it a brui. Now it's spelled B-R-U-I-T, but it's pronounced like B-R-U-Y, brui, brui. It's a French word. And, and we hear that buzzing sound when we listen. And it should be very low pitched and continuous. And I'm gonna to try to mimic that sound as continuous. Now, if you listen and it's high pitched and not continuous like that suggests that you have a narrowing or stenosis somewhere in your access that is limiting the blood flow. Next slide. So we have the pulse, the thrill and the brewery. These are all things that you can feel and hear. Uh, and the point of this is to detect the presence of a narrowing or stenosis within the access because that narrowing it, it can be progressive and eventually lead to thrombosis or clotting of your access. And the reason why we like under normal circumstances to get that taken care of it, in, in a, an elective fashion is to prevent thrombosis, which because the thrombosis occurs, now we have an emergency situation. So we like to do it prospectively as a preventative. And the yeah, earlier, I, I, yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I would like to say, you know, when we, when we talk to our patients, you know, in, in this regard, I think it's kind of easy, you know, to really think of these things away from dialysis for a moment. Think of a highway that's near you, it's supposed to be three, four lanes, and everyone's doing, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, whatever it is, and then you get down to one lane. Uh, that's kind of where you see these changes, and what you don't want is a complete traffic backup. And I, I think that kind of resonates with people that they can see that, you know, that the cars are yes. stopping, and the cars are red blood cells. Yes, exactly. And, and, and the earlier that's treated, the, the, the more likely could we are to prevent thrombosis. But now let, let's let me go back to that slide just a moment. Now we're in a, a, a unique situation now with this pandemic. So if we just have stenosis, this narrowing, and you're able to dialyze effectively, your dialysis is going okay. You're not having trouble with your dialysis. It's okay to wait. Now under normal circumstances, we wouldn't want to wait. But in the circumstances in which we exist, which is unique, it's okay to wait. But if it clots, if it thrombosis, then we can't wait. Then it becomes an emergency. Next slide. So if we just look at these three things together, normal, the pulse should be soft, your access should be easily compressible. With narrowing or stenosis, there's a strong pulse. It's pounding, it's forceful. The thrill that you feel, the buzz, normally it's diffuse, it's soft, it's continuous, it's machinery-like. With narrowing, it tends to be not continuous. It tends to be more accentuated. We didn't mention this point 
before, but, but at the point of stenosis, there's a lot of turbulence uh, of blood flow and, and you can feel a very strong thrill where you didn't used to feel one. Normally it, it was not there, but now it's there. That indicates the point of the stenosis. The brewing normally is it's, it's continuous. It's, it, it, it's in both the systolic part of the heartbeat and the diastolic part. It's low pitched with narrowing. It tends to be uh, discontinuous. It's short, high pitched, as, as we mentioned a moment ago. Next slide. Now there is something else that, that can be done sometimes uh, that is, is helpful. If you, uh, even if you have a large fistula, if you raise your arm above the level of your heart, that fistula will collapse. If that fistula collapses, it means that all of the outflow is open. You do not have a significant narrowing anywhere within it. And that's what we see in the left hand arm on this slide. On the right hand arm, on the other hand, we see a excess that has a, a narrowing in it, a stenosis. If you raise your hand above the level of your heart, your arm, that portion that's, it will not collapse. And that sometimes is a useful test. Next slide. And this just shows that. On the left, we see a patient with their arm down. You see that the fistula is kind of distended. It's, it has a little aneurysm there. And they raise their arm up. And now you can see an indentation, actually, where that aneurysm was, where it's collapsed. And that's a good sign. It means that the outflow is all completely normal. Now, there is a unique type of narrowing of your access that we call central vein stenosis. And I show this in a kind of a cartoon fashion. And the, 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 the thing that is typical here, we see all the things that we've already mentioned related to this narrowing within your access, the stenosis. But a addition, a unique feature is swelling of your arm. If your arm, if your access arm becomes swollen, it means that you have a stenosis are narrowing within a vein in your chest, one of the central veins. And that is very important because if that closes off, then you're not able to have an access in that arm again, uh, very likely. Again, in today's environment with the pandemic going on, the question is, is that a, uh, an emergency or not? And, uh, uh, it, and that is gonna depend upon evaluation by your caregivers. So if you notice your arm starts swelling, you need to let your caregiver know so they can evaluate it. They may feel that that's an emergency and, and, and that would need to be taken care of, or they may say, well, let's wait a week or two and watch it. Next slide. Next slide. So let's say a little bit about the catheter. There are two types of catheter. The acute catheter, as you see on the left, and the tunnel catheter. Now the acute catheter, uh, we, we don't like to use for very long. If you have an acute catheter in place, if you're a patient listening to what we're talking about here and you have an acute catheter, getting that catheter changed to either a tunnel catheter or maybe you have a fistula that's waiting to mature, checking to see if that's ready to use and getting rid of that acute catheter, I would classify as a low level emergency because the, the uh, effect, uh, the uh, incidence of infection with this acute catheter is very high. And so as long as that acute catheter is in place, you are at significant risk of developing an infection and that infection could be quite serious. The one on the, one on the right is the tunnel catheter. It has a tunnel and here, the, the, it's, it, and that, as Dr. Kramer mentioned a while ago, uh, infection can occur but the infection rate is much lower. And, and, uh, and, and so uh, th this catheter is a much better catheter to use over long term. Next slide. So Q catheter we use only short term, two weeks or less is kind of the guideline. Many people like to even have it even less than that. Uh, if the dialysis is going to continue, it needs to be exchanged for a tongue catheter, or you may have a fistula or graft that's maturing and that should be used. Uh, and the reason is the infection. Next slide. Next slide. Okay. Now, we 
with the catheter that you have, there are two situations that represent emergencies that need to be taken care of immediately. First is infection. Now, not all infections represent emergency. We'll, we'll highlight the one that does. There are two types of infection. One is just a local infection. It is most often associated with the site where the catheter exits the skin. And we call it an exit site infection. The other is a systemic infection. It's an infection in the bloodstream. And it is a serious problem. This is an emergency. This needs to be taken care of immediately. It requires administration of systemic antibiotics. What I mean by that is antibiotics given intravenously and either removal or exchange of that catheter. Next slide. So here is a local infection. This is preventable. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kramer mentioned the importance of keeping this covered, keeping it clean, and keeping it uh, uh, from being uh, mechanically irritated by excessive movement of the catheter, those types of things, will prevent this local infection. But if it occurs, it's not an emergency unless you begin to have chills and fever. Uh, this can generally be treated locally by cleaning it, uh, applying antibiotic ointments, and this type of thing. It can progress to a more serious problem, so it needs to be addressed, but it doesn't represent an emergency. Next slide. On the other hand, the systemic infection, this is characterized by chills and fever. Most of these cases, you come in the dialysis unit, you're feeling pretty much normal, you're feeling relatively well, and they hook you up to dialysis, and all of a sudden you begin to have chills and fever. That means that you now have a systemic infection associated with your catheter. And, and uh, this can occur at any time, uh, and, and, uh, it, and it needs to be addressed immediately. Now, it can be more serious than what I just described. In some instances, patients can develop chills and fever at home, not on dialysis. They can have low blood pressure and even have shock, very low blood pressure in, in shock situation. And this requires hospitalization, and this, of course, is an absolute uh, emergency. All of these cases, whether it be the one that just develops when you come in for dialysis with chills and fever, or the very more serious one associated with, with uh, uh, shock levels of blood pressure, require intravenous antibiotics, hospitalization, catheter removal, or exchange. Next slide. Next slide. Now, uh, there are, I, I don't think I have a slide in here, but I'm going to want to mention, what if your catheter stops working? Now, you, you're dependent upon a catheter, and it's not working. So, what, is that a, 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 an emergency? Yes. If you cannot dialyze, it represents emergency. How long can you go without dialysis? A limited period of time. Therefore, this is an emergency. There, there are some patients uh, in, in whom the catheter represents a permanent dialysis access, not many, but some. Uh, and, but for most patients, the goal is to remove uh, the, the catheter uh, and, and move from the catheter to an access uh, in the arm as quickly as possible. Uh, and so when the catheter is no longer needed, it's important that it remove, be removed as quickly as possible. Now, that's under normal, normal, uh, normal circumstances. So what about under the current circumstances with the pandemic? Well, we, we're saying we, we, we should only be treating emergency cases. So there's some controversy uh, over whether what I just described represents an emergency or not. So let me paint this picture a little bit more clearly. You had the catheter, but you also had a fistula or graft. You were using this as a bridge, waiting for that fistula or graft to become usable. Now you're using it. So now you're using your fistula and you have a catheter. We'd like to get that out as quickly as possible. Is that an emergency? Well, I think many people would say, no, that's not an emergency. It needs to be done under normal circumstances. We'd want to do it today. We'd want to do it now. But under the current circumstances, can we wait two weeks? Can we wait three weeks? Can we wait even four weeks? Probably so. Probably so. As long as you're not using it, the, in, the chances of infection are decreased. Infection, we think, is generally related to contamination of the catheter when it's being used. So if you're not using it, incidence of infection goes down. So this 
probably does not represent an emergency, but your caregiver will be able to make that decision with you, to help you make that decision. Next slide. Oh, well, let me mention something at the bottom of this slide before we go to it. Now, if you have an emergency with your access, where should you go? Well, number one is do not go to the emergency room. Do not go to the emergency room. The thing that you should do is call your nephrologist or speak with the dialysis access clinic staff, your caregivers, and, and let them know, you know, this, and they, of course they'll recognize as well, this is going on, this needs to be taken care of. You can bypass the emergency room, go directly in the hospital. Now, if you have a choice between a large major hospital or a smaller facility, perhaps where you live, there's an amateur surgical center where this can be done. Or there are also clinics that are, that we call office-based the facilities that are much like an amateur surgical center, but th that's all they do. They're just dedicated for that. It's much better to go to a smaller facility, if you can, than to go to the large medical center hospital, where there is a larger concentration of patients and likelihood of contact of patients that have coronavirus. Next slide. Now, as Dr. Kramer mentioned, size, uh, emphasize it, and I want to emphasize it again, is don't fail to go to your dialysis treatment. Now, you, you're, you're apprehensive, and it's, you're apprehensive for understandable reasons. Every, anybody in your situation would be apprehensive. That's common sense. But you can't miss your dialysis, or you're going to end up with an emergency situation. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call your caregiver. Next slide. So what represents an emergency? Any access problem that prevents you from receiving your dialysis treatment is an emergency. Thrombosed access or non-functional catheter, clotted access, or clotted catheter. Infection, a systemic infection or deep infection over access, those certainly represent emergencies. Next slide. Aneurysm or pseudorasm with ulceration or bleeding is an emergency situation that can rupture it, it in a moment and, and with severe bleeding complications. Hand ischemia, if you have intolerable pain in your hand, and, and you just can't dialyze because it hurts so badly, you just can't do it. That's an emergency. Evidence of tissue involvement with ulcerations in the skin, that's an emergency. And if, you, if you're a new dialysis patient, and probably none of you are, but you may have family members that may be, unfortunately, if you're a new dialysis patient with immediate need for dialysis, that's an emergency uh, uh, situation. Next slide. So what about presence of stenosis within access? If your dialysis can be done and it's effective, waiting to have the stenosis treat, treatment is frequently possible. This is an elective treatment, and it, even under normal circumstances, it's not unusual for this to be scheduled a month in advance. But if dialysis cannot be performed, or if dialysis is not effective, it represents an emergent problem, and it has to be addressed. And, and discussing this with your caregiver, you can determine whether this is an emergency or not. If it's an emergency, then that's what it is, and it needs to be taken care of immediately, and the hospital turns you away, they are in error. If you can dialyze and, and, and manage to make it for two, three, or four weeks, that's the best course to take. Next slide. And we've already mentioned this. I won't discuss it further. Uh, if you have a catheter that's no longer being used, is an emergency, it may or may not be. That's something you decide with your caregiver. Next slide. And that's all. And thank you very much. It's been a real privilege to, to present this to you. And I hope, it, hope you find it helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Beathard. This was really great information. I love how you laid everything out. Our final speaker today is Terry Litchfield. 
Terry is a dedicated patient advocate and an AKP ambassador. Her husband, Bill, prior to his death a few years ago, celebrated 46 years of renal replacement therapy. As a care partner during home dialysis or supportive of in-center care, she well knows the impacts of kidney disease on a family. Terry has spent more than 30 years in the healthcare field with an emphasis on dialysis-related care. Best known for her outcomes research in disease management for renal disease and chronic kidney disease patients, she is the author of a number of publications in the field. Thank you for joining us today, Terry, and let me know when you're ready for the next. I'll take the first slide, and thank you, everybody, for listening today. From the House of Kidney, as you heard from all the speakers, your access is key. And really, good dialysis is only achieved when you have good access, and your access is your lifeline. Richard and I sing, this, sing the same song. And again, pay attention to your access. I'm gonna show a few ways for you and your family members, whether it's a, a spouse or a son or a daughter. Next slide, please. The first thing is good hygiene. And I know through this entire COVID pandemic, everyone tells you to wash your hands. And I'm gonna tell you again, wash your hands. Wash your hands and wash your hands again. Keep the skin over your access clean. It's really important to use good access hygiene, cleaning that access to lower your risk of infection and to also know your access. Our next slide. Dr. Bethard and Dr. Kramer also told you check your access every day. At the Litchfield House each Sunday, I would actually listen and examine my husband's access, and you will absolutely see changes over time. And so you will hear, you can measure it, get a little notebook, and what early identification will do, and it's often the patient or the spouse or the family member, will really help with early identification because it's your access, it's your arm. And so our next slide, especially about catheters, because patients that have a catheter, I can't under, I, you just can't imagine the importance of keeping your catheter clean and, dark and dry. And I know it's very difficult, especially as we're approaching summer months. And I am a believer that, that patients get really cranky if they aren't able to shower or bathe. Sometimes um, you can take a kind of bath by sitting in a bathtub. But if possible, wear protective waterproof covering over your catheter. Um, I, I, we used to sometimes instruct patients to wrap, wrap their upper catheter with um, saran wrap. Make sure the dressing is clean and dry. Check the skin around your catheter and be sure and tell your dialysis unit if you see any drainage or redness coming through, even if it's not a dialysis day. And be proactive, especially as we're in COVID. Ask for catheter care supplies at the dialysis unit, like dressings and tape, in case you have uh, one of your bandages fall off of your catheter. Next slide. Take charge of your care. And I think this is an important theme with my husband celebrating so many years on dialysis. You have to take an active role in your treatment speak up and notify your kidney doctor or the nurses or the patient care tech if you see changes in your access because it could mean the difference in the health of your access and then my final slide covid 19 safety tips for dialysis patients i know that the president and your governors and your mayors said to stay at home but we have an exception for you go to dialysis. We'd like to ask you to stay home as much as you can. If you have family members or friends who could go to the grocery store or the pharmacy for you, have them do that. I know everybody, like I do, I love my grandchildren, but now is not the time to see your grandchildren. Stay home, stay safe, go to dialysis, 
if you do have an access related emergency you are going to maybe need to have care for it keep clean take your medicines as prescribed if you haven't already obtained additional medicines ask your doctor if it is possible for you to have an extra prescription of your major drugs this is not a time to go off your dialysis diet this is not the time to eat drink and be merry follow your dialysis diet because you don't want to cause other problems by going off your diet if you have any access problems tell your dialysis center and if need be they will contact your nephrologist if your center says that your access needs repair, replacement, or maintenance, please go. And so that's the tips that I have today. And I thank you all. And I want everyone to stay safe. And when this pandemic is over, we'll be coming back to you with even more ideas. Thank you so much, Terry. That was fantastic. And thank you again to all of today's speakers. We do have a couple of questions that have come in um, during the presentation. So I will uh, read those out loud and, and hopefully uh, one of our fantastic speakers today can respond. One of our questions is, um, states, I am a dialysis patient. I do dialysis three days a week for three hours each time. My question is, my arm access has an aneurysm bulging on my arm. My nephrologist and vascular surgeon doesn't want to help me fix my arm. I don't know what to do. So this is Terry, um, uh, and I'm not the doctor, but I am gonna I am gonna say something first. Is that and I found this in a study I just recently participated in. What their arms look like means a lot to patients. And so the doctors have talked a lot about when an aneurysm is an emergency. And so one of the things is to be really honest with your surgeon and your nephrologist that the aneurysm is bothersome. Um, and then as Dr. Kramer mentioned, there are some new types of access for a fistula that actually is a percutaneous, it creates it without a surgery and surgical scars. Now, now I'll let the doctors answer, but I wanted to be really clear that a bulging aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm in an arm is bothersome for most patients. Yeah, I think that um, Dr. Bethard actually handled, you know, the, uh, the question, and it may, it may have already been self-explanatory, but, you know, to reiterate, uh, there's bothersome, and then there's, you know, when, when medicine we describe as clinically significant. And so bothersome is, is what we would say in today's world, maybe just a cosmetic issue. Um, but you, if you're not getting adequate dialysis because the blood is circulating around in that aneurysm and you're having lab abnormalities and you're not getting appropriate clearance and your dialysis treatments itself are inefficient, you can, you can end up in an emergency situation uh, despite having, um, you know, clinical symptoms of the skin being uh, breaking down, et cetera. Um, but those circumstances, honestly, are less uh, than, in my experience, uh, than seeing what Dr. Bethard, I think, described very well. The ulcerated access, I think, in this time would be more concerning. If the, if the aneurysm is not pulsatile, if there's good skin, uh, and your dialysis is adequate, uh, I would frame that as a more elective you know, consideration. Certainly, you keep your eyes on it for changes, the look, listen, feel um, that might accentuate or accelerate your need for a more urgent revision. But in the environment today, um, I wouldn't recommend, you know, if it were my family or friends or, or patients, I wouldn't recommend them to come into a center uh, for a more elective procedure and uh, under any circumstances just because of the associated risks and exposures that Dr. Bethard and uh, you know, Ms. Litchfield have already alluded to. These are, uh, these, are, these are dangerous times, and your risk factors for most dialysis patients is extremely high to become susceptible 
uh, to ailments under normal circumstances, and particularly uh, in, in today's aggressiveness uh, and contagiousness of the COVID, you wouldn't want to catch a virus that you didn't have. Uh, you wouldn't want to bring it back home, and you certainly wouldn't want to bring it back to your community, whether it be in a, a home setting, your assisted living center, a nursing home, or back to the dialysis center where you can, you're going to be in close contact with others. So in the setting that you've described, that I probably would push that off as an elective thing to be on the phone with your provider and, and keep close check with your dialysis center and, um, and certainly look to have it investigated. What are your thoughts, Dr. Bethard? Well, I, I agree totally. Now, I, there's one uh, facet of this that, that, that I, I would like to mention that, that uh, this may not be the case, but this person may be uh, really concerned, really uh, obviously concerned about the cosmetic appearance. Uh, what about when this pandemic is over? What about when we get back to normal circumstances, which we eventually will? And, and I think, you know, I think that many uh, uh, vascular surgeons uh, and many nephrologists uh, tend to discourage patients to have uh, surgery like this done for cosmetic reasons. On the other hand, we have a cosmetic surgery industry that amounts to billions of dollars per year. So I think patient, every patient is individual, and that's obvious. Uh, and, and some patients will have uh, something that uh, uh, is cosmetically objectionable to them. It's affecting their quality of life because of the way it appears. I think that's justification for having that uh, repaired. It can be repaired. It's not serious surgery, but it is elective. And I, I think you know when things get back to normal, uh, if if uh, the surgeon that you go to says, well, I just don't do this. I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, my recommendation, find another one. I, I agree with you. And, you know, there, there's another caveat to this that I'd like to, you know, put back in the hands of the patients on the call. Make sure you're managing your blood pressure really well. Um, you know, uh, typically, you know, we see these things that, um, that, that evolve, and a lot of it has to do with sometimes how particular patients are about managing their blood pressure or, or encouraging their nephrologist to help them manage their blood pressure. Um, and if you're not, you know, paying attention to that, you know, a very high blood pressure, which is not atypical at all, and is actually relatively common um, for dialysis patients, that can certainly aggravate, um, you know, the formation of these aneurysms and, and create challenges for your dialysis access on a good day. Uh, so if you, if you couple that with the natural history of a dialysis access, which is typically some narrowing, and back pressure that develops there, if you add the blood pressure component to that and, and allow your blood pressure to be uncontrolled, you're not acting, I think, in your best, safest way, particularly in this environment. But even on a, on a non-pandemic you know, weekend, you, you would want to manage your blood pressure and be sure that you're taking care of your basic health maintenance. You know, another, another point, I think it's a good, good point, and, and it, not just systemic blood pressure, but also pressure within the access, because many of these, if, if you have a, an aneurysm or pseudoaneurysm, and it is getting progressively larger, you may have a stenosis uh, of that access that is causing the pressure within the access to be higher than normal and is affecting that. So I would advise anyone who has a, an enlarging access to uh, ask their caregivers to be sure and evaluate their access for the presence of stenosis that may be aggravating the problem. Thank you so much for that response. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm gonna move forward with some of our closing slides, but if there are any questions that we didn't get to during today's webinar, please reach out to us at AAK, info at aakp.org and we'll work with today's speakers to provide a response. If you're not already a member of AAKP, we encourage you, encourage you to join us. We offer free membership to patients and their family members as well as living kidney donors. AAKP is dedicated to helping patients understand their condition and take control of their health care. We are proud to offer a variety of resources for both patients, family members, and caregivers. 
By visiting our website and clicking on the AAKP store button at the top of the homepage, you can find a variety of educational brochures and online tools to order online by phone or download. AAKP holds a number of events throughout the year, and these events are live streamed and recorded. Please visit our YouTube channel to watch presentations from our Global Summit on Kidney Innovations, hosted in partnership with George Washington University, our annual policy summit, and our annual national patient meeting. I'd like to remind everyone that this webinar has been recorded and will be made available on our coronavirus resource page, as well as on our Healthline webinar page. For more patient resources on COVID-19 and to listen to on-demand webinars or any of the previous webinars that we have hosted regarding COVID-19 with our strategic partners like the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, please visit our coronavirus resource page on the AAKP website. You can also access this page from our homepage. You'll see a big red coronavirus information button at the top of the page. We'd again like to thank today's speakers, Dr. Kramer, Dr. Bethard, and Terry Litchfield for sharing with us important information on how to care for your dialysis access during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to again thank today's webinar sponsor and share the following message from Avenue Medical on their commitment to the kidney patient community during this time. Hello, I'm Mark Richard, CEO and co-founder of Avenue Medical. The world is facing a pandemic unlike anything we've seen in our lifetimes. While much is still unknown about COVID-19, what is clear is that this virus is most deadly to people who are elderly and those with pre-existing conditions. And perhaps no single group of Americans is more dangerously at risk than the 500,000 patients in the U.S. who depend on dialysis. There are many ways to get dialysis and all of them require some form of access. The preferred method of access is a fistula. Yet, creating these fistulas has traditionally required surgery in an operating room. As hospitals across the nation become overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients, there may soon be no available resources for these surgeries. Using the Ellipsis Endo AVF system, physicians now have a less invasive option to creating fistulas that can be done in an outpatient setting instead of an operating room, thereby preserving precious hospital resources. We are facing an urgent public health crisis and Avenue Medical is committed to doing our part. We want to make sure the whole community is aware of the available options to reduce the strain on our local hospitals during this unprecedented crisis without sacrificing the needs of some of our most vulnerable community members. We are passionate about doing everything in our power to give kidney patients the best possible care and quality of life. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you.